So this is Mark, and yeah, feel free to start. Okay, great. Uh, all right, well, hi all. Uh, thank you all so much for coming along to this talk. Um, so some of the talks we, ha we have just had have been more focused on code and on tech issues. Uh, this is more of a kind of design focused and um, aesthetics focused talk, I guess. So um, a quick thing on who I am. So I'm from the UK, but, but I've moved around quite a lot uh, in the last kind of 10 years or so of being a games uh, researcher. And I recently picked up a, a tenured position at the University of Sydney, where I'm now based, um, and where I co-lead the um, University of Sydney Games and Play Lab. And in my kind of day job, my uh, research is on esports and Twitch, neither one of which is PCG, of course, but in my spare time, I make a, a PCG game. And what I'm going to be talking about a bit in this talk is how um, I went about creating items within this game and trying to expand some of the kind of procedural item creation systems we see in games like uh, Bloodborne, for instance, or games like Borderlands into something much kind of bigger and wider in terms of how we might think about creating items in games and using PCG techniques to create those items. So uh, the game I make, I've been making for the last 10 years, it's called Ultima Ratio Regum. Um, I started this game I, in the same year I started a, a, a PhD because apparently one like massive life-changing project wasn't enough for me at the time. Um, and I've been doing this for the last 10 years now. And in essence, in the game, uh, the game generates a kind of scientific revolution era world in which the player's task is to talk to people and study items and study books and explore places with the goal of trying to solve a, a, a cryptic and a procedurally created mystery within that game. And it's a work in progress, but there's uh, also a lot to explore and look at in there right now. So this is what the game looks like. So here uh, we are taking a look at the uh, world, at the world map, at a city. We are looking at who owns that city. Now, now we are in a uh, town and we are looking at signs on shops to see what they might sell. And all of this, of course, is procedurally created. Now we go into a shop, we have a look at some, at some of these shields. This shop is selling and every single one of these shields should be unique. Now we talk to someone, uh, how all the uh, in-game NPCs look is also procedurally created. And here we are having a chat with them and every sentence we say and every sentence they say back is, is, is uh, also PCG. And so one of the kind of goals goals in this game has has always been to kind of create PCG content at lots of sorts of levels. So the game creates a world which might look something like this. And then within that world, we might find things like towns and cities and so on, which might look like this. And then if we zoom in further to the level of specific buildings, um, every nation within this world has a, a procedurally created architectural style as well. And so build things might look like these. And then every character within every building is also an object. And every object within the, the game also varies. So the objects you might find within the game world, for instance, might look like things like these. So clothes, chairs, graves, um, tombstones, vases, and so on. All of these are procedurally created graphics and uh, everything within the game world from chairs to trees to clothes to whatever it might be are created with these sorts of systems. And this also, of course, applies to the people within the game. And on the right-hand side, there is a kind of clip of what the game looks like being played where we have a bunch of bunch of uh, characters here moving around a cathedral but what i want to talk about in this talk is item creation so um as we've seen um lots of games do use procedural content creation to create items i think borderlands is probably the most well known of these i'd say but quite a few games do this but this tends to be limited to to specific or set kinds of kinds of items right so in bloodborne in um board in, in Borderlands, it's guns. In Bloodborne, it's blood gems and so on. Um, and so it tends to be a single type of item which games which use PCG to make I items focus on making. But one thing I wanted, to, I wanted to explore here was what if just every single item in the entire game world 
is procedurally created to a greater or lesser extent, whether it's a gun, a shield, a map, a book, a shovel, or just a plate or a box in someone's home. What if absolutely every item in the entire game world is, I hope, you unique? What might that be like to create? What might that be like to play? Um, and in this talk, therefore, I'm going to talk a little, a little bit about some of the systems in the game which create this wide range of PCG items um, and how they were built, some of, the hur some of the hurdles and some of the challenges of creating this, these kinds of systems, and also what, what it's like, or, or what I hope it's like, for players to move through a world where every item is special rather than just some kinds of items. So the four things I'll be talking through here are how I made this, the kind of broader aesthetic I wanted the player to get when they explored this world and engaged with its large number of very unique items, some of the issues and challenges which I ran into in trying to procedurally create such a large number of different sorts of things, and also what kind of player experience am I trying to create out of these sorts of systems? So first off, techniques. Um, this is a 2D ANSI-based game, which is like ASCII, of course, but not quite. And so um, an item within my game is, in essence, a single graphic. And so what I did here was um, at the most kind of basic level, we have kind of layers of things which um, add up to the final ANSI character visual which the player sees. So one quite nice kind of basic example of this is, some, is something like coins. In the game world, every civilization has its own coinage and the coinage is procedurally created. Um, so here, for instance, we have four on the right hand side. Um, and these just vary as far as I can think on four axes. They, based on what the coin's made out of, like gold or copper or silver and so on, uh, what shape it is, and we see four, four shapes here, what kind of little um, sort of patterns and things of that, uh, and things of that sort are, are on the edges of these coins, and also what the core uh, image on the coin is, wh whether as in this case, it might be a scarab, a helmet, a ship, a temple and so on. And, Across all these, there's roughly uh, 60,000 coins which the game can dream up. And that might not sound like such, such, such a big number compared to some PCG systems, but within a single playthrough, within a single world, the player will, never, will not ever see more than, say, 20 or so. And so it would take a vast amount of play to ever begin to exhaust the variation in coins which the game can make. But 6TK is quite low, so let's try to um, increase it a bit. A slightly more complex sy sy system is the one which the game uses to create board games. And within the game, you can find board games in shops, in kind of people's homes, in parks, and so on. And even the board games themselves are in turn procedurally created. So in this case, we had four main kind of archetypes, which were chess type games, go type games, race type games and Pachisi type games. And in this case, the uh, system is more complex than just trying to kind of layer things on top of each other, as in the case of coins. Instead, we have many more systems at work here, which create the size of that board, what the board looks like, how pieces move, what pieces look like, where the game pieces start and so on. And it also creates names for the games as well, as you can see in that slide. Um, and this system can yield roughly 3 million games or so. In a future version, I do hope to have the player be able to play these games within the game. Right now, they are just objects rather than things which you can play, but soon I hope you will be able to play them also. And 3 million um, unique board games is good, but again, I think we can do better. So for instance, something like the systems which create the uh, clothes and the armor within the game are much more complicated than the two I've just shown. Here, there's a large database of kind of pieces. So in the case of helms, for instance, the uh, top part, the kind of nose ridge thing, the inner edges, the height of the back thing, um, the kind of metal lines on the front and so on, 
um, and what color and what and what it's made out of and where rivets are and where the rivets show and all these sorts of things add up to there being roughly, I think, 2.2 billion potential helmets which you could find in this game. I therefore hope no player will ever will ever see the same helmet uh, twice, and if they do, something has gone quite badly wrong. Um, and so one of the kind of intriguing parts, parts of this, I think, is that um, one, of, one of the issues with PCG is that, yes, it can create different things, but, but that doesn't necessarily mean the things it creates, whether they are coins or helmets or board games or levels or dungeons or whatever. It doesn't necessarily mean those things are meaningfully or um, substantially different from each other. Kate Compton, for instance, has talked about this idea of the 10,000 bowls of plain oatmeal, that you could create a, a, a game system which places every oat in every bowl in its own place, but that doesn't mean that those bowls are of interest to look at, right? And so one thing I've done in this game is that every single procedural creation system in this game has a kind of extra set of rules to keep track of, of what it's already made and to then ensure that other things made in the future can't be like it. So everything generated within the game is stored and every time the game makes something new, it checks that it hasn't already made something kind of like it in order to make sure everything is different. So what kind of aesthetic was, was I trying to build up here? Well, in making all these kind of procedures I item creation systems, the idea was to create a sense that the player was kind of falling down a rabbit hole and kind of finding this whole complete world within the game. And so one part of this was trying to create a consistent aesthetic or consistent art styles or the use of color and shape and so on across different sorts of items within a single nation. So for instance, every nation within the game likes or dislikes a different set of things of shapes or of colors or of aesthetic styles and so on. Um, and these are meant to be consistent across the sorts of items you might find with, within the game. So here we have a shield, a helmet, a uh, box, a book, and a rug, not to scale, of course, um, but they, they all show that this nation likes yellow and gold and they like circles. And these are the sorts, sorts of things which are meant to be repeated across all the items within every uh, playthrough which a player does. But also in turn, the idea here was that uh, the player should, should come to recognize the aesthetic styles of the items they see in games. If we think about something like Skyrim, say, every home has the same bowls, right? The same bowls, same plates and so on. Whereas in this game, every nation has its own set of plates, its own set of armor, its own set of whatever. And all of these are procedurally created by the game. And so the idea here is that specific items should be similar enough to each other that you can tell they come from the, from the same nation, but also individually unique as well at the same time. And when you play it, it's quite fun to kind of try to work out where someone might be from, where an in-game character might be from based on how they are dressed or how they talk to you and, and things of this sort. So next up, what were the hurdles? What were the issues with creating all these sorts of sy systems for creating all these sorts of items? So um, some items are really hard to find variation for. One great example of this was canes, which you can see here. Um, a cane is just a piece of wood with a handle on it. It's very hard to think, how can I make this very, how might I make every cane within this game unique? Um, and one thing I, I did is to kind of slightly alter things from their real world versions can be quite a good way to bring out variation with, with in this context instead. So for, so for instance, real, real world canes don't always have like little kind of loops, which, which are under the uh, handles, but here you can see that all these canes do. And likewise, at the kind of base of the cane, they have little kind of shapes, and those shapes vary based on, based on each nation, and the, and the higher the crafting quality of the cane in question, being low, middle, and high from left to right here, 
um, more of these patterns show up. And so the idea here was to find things which might not um, exist in the real world versions of these items, but can be brought out here to make sure every single version and every single copy of these items within the game is indeed varied. By the flip side though, is that some items are really easy to vary. One of my proudest um, as aspects of this is the game's is the game's procedural book creation. Um, I don't know how many books the game can make. I haven't worked it out. Um, it's well into the tens or hundreds of billions, I think, in terms of covers. And the covers uh, represent, to some extent, what's in that book. So a religious book or a book about language, a book about philosophy, a book about historical events and so on, all have different sorts of styles. And in this picture, you might be able to spot kind of five or six styles of books here. Um, the content of the books I'm working on now, so watch the space. But in terms of how the books look, again, no two books within the game world should ever look the same. And no, no two copies of the same book also should look exactly the same, although they should look kind of broadly similar-ish. But also uh, one thing I found, and maybe this sounds like a kind of excuse and, and it might be, is that some items don't need to be varied as much as others. So even in this kind of slightly pre-industrial era, which the game is placed in, um, not all items have to be completely unique. Things like swords and armor and so on, um, to some extent, were mass produced, even in an era prior to what, to, to what we now call mass production. So the level of change and the level of variation here can be quite a bit lower, and it still looks good. It still makes sense to the player. Last off, what's this like for the player to explore this kind of world? We are extremely used to kind of getting to know items and how and what and what items look like in games. And though we don't think of it, like I say, most games which which do in part construct a world through items do tend to have the same items in every place, such as the plates and bowls and so on in a game like Skyrim. So what's it like being in a world where every item is unique? So here on the right hand side, um, every box, every plate and things of this sort in the game is also unique. Um, and what I think this does, I hope it does at least, I think it gives a kind of weight and me and meaning to the items you find in games, especially well where thanks for the time, uh, heads up, where in most games, these kinds of items can be the exact same item placed in lots of places. In this game, instead, every item is its own thing. And I think it does lend a kind of consequence or impact to the items which, which the player finds and which the player engages with. Also, I think it does keep the player kind of... Um, it prevents items from becoming norm, from becoming kind of normal or standard or default. And there's always the kind of chance of finding something which looks new and therefore might also have some new purpose or some new function within the game every time you find a new item. And as part of this, within the game as a whole, one of the goals was, was always that the world should not appear to have been created. Um, it should seem real in some sense. And this kind of lived in-ness is quite hard to find in games, right? Most games, when we play them, when we play a kind of level or when we visit a part of that game, it feels like a part of a game. It feels like a kind of level in a game. It feels like a home, a castle, a building, whatever, which someone has made. By, by contrast, however, um, one of my chief inspirations here are the games from um, from software things like Dark Souls and Elden Ring and so on, where these worlds are kind of meticulously built to look like they've been lived in. And there's this real focus on kind of, on kind of every item, every space, every place looking like it's real and it's lived in and has some kind of past to it, which is something that lots of games tend not to capture. So to sum up, um, varying every item in a game takes time. Uh, it took me a lot longer to make all this happen than to 
merely kind of put in like default plates and default swords and default armor and so on. It did take time, but um, I thought it, I thought it, I thought it was very rewarding as a creator, and also I think does a lot for the kind of world building and for the and for the immersion aspects of this game. And so, as a kind of design goal, you can try to make PCG look handmade through these kinds of tech techniques, as that's something which lots of PCG type games tend to kind of struggle with sometimes. But, but also, like I say, some items are much easier to do this with than others, to put it mildly. For kind of simpler items or, or more basic items, it can take quite a bit of thought to work out how do, how, how do I make this very, very, how do I make each, each version of this item into its own thing. And I'll leave you with a quote from um, Swiss sculptor Alberto Giacometti, who said, the object of art is not to reproduce reality, but to create a new reality of the same intensity. And that quote, and that quote, I think, really kind of pins down what I am trying to do here, not to create the world we live in now, but to create a world where there's as much variation, as much diff difference as wide a range of items and things as there are in the real world. So thanks so much. Uh, I really appreciate your being here and any questions. So there's a question in the Q&A tab. Uh, I can go straight, straight to that one if that's the easiest thing to do. Yeah, you can go with it. Great, yeah. Um, so Daniel asks, um, can you give examples of how you compare the uniqueness of two items? Yeah, sure. So um, the systems which check whether an item like the one being made has previously been made or not, um, those systems are unique to every generator the game has. But in essence, um, for every generator, I chose the things which which would make the items look samey. So if it's like um, helmets, the shape of the helmet is far more crucial to whether a helmet looks new or the same compared to say the uh, the kind of rivets or screws on it and so on. So for every generation system, I create a list of things which are important and a list of things which are less important. And then every time the game tries to create something new, it checks the idea of the new thing against the list of old things, starting with the important things and working down. And if it goes kind of over a critical number, then it says, okay, this, okay, this is too samey, let's not do this. And then it rolls Again, um, if it doesn't go above that number, then it says, okay, this is new enough, and then it goes in. And so trying to kind of balance those and tweak those is something which is basically different for every item, every graphic, everything in the entire game. But um, I think I've got most of them to a point where, because like if, if every single thing had to be completely unique, um, it might run out of permutations while the player is playing. So there's this kind of trade trade off of it should be different, it should be distinctive enough, but maybe not completely distinctive. Also, yeah. Thanks for the um, question. Uh, Floyd asks. Yes, uh, how do things connect to other pieces? Um, the answer is that's just handmade. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there where. I just took the time to to try to make sure things that should look similar-ish, like hell, like uh, helmets or um, gaunt uh, luts or uh, books and so on. I just took the time making sure they look similar enough, and that just took a lot of testing. So that aspect is handmade. I think with like modern image AI and so on, you probably you probably could create create a system which can do that itself. But for me, I think it's easier to, to kind of hand write what these links should be and then set up the game to create these. Um, and Floyd also asks, um, do, you, do you create data such as the quality which affects how it's created? Uh, yes, yes. Um, things like clothes and items and so on come in a range of qualities and that will always um, change based on who, who owns that thing, who wears that thing and so on. Um, and also uh, where it's found and these sorts of things, yeah. 
uh, Tim asks, is there a public build? Yes, there is. Um, head on to my website, which you can find on my Twitter, and it is there, yes. Um, we're gonna we're gonna ask some how, questions how from the audience when, here. When you consider an aspect of the game done, uh, I consider aspects of the game done when I can no longer bear to work on it. One of the things about PCG games, as I'm sure people in the crowd and speakers and so on will know, um, you can kind of go go endlessly making things change and making things new and so on. So I basically just stop a certain just um, a a set part of it when I basically can't bear working on it any longer and when I think it's kind of good enough, yeah. Mark, do you hear us? Mark, 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 Mark. Yes. Okay, 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 okay. So we're gonna actually ask some questions from the, the crowd here. Just a couple of questions. No, 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 no. Never mind. Uh, I can hear you. Are we going to questions from the audience, or is my time up? Yeah, we wanted to have, have the questions from the audience, but then... then yeah, 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 yeah. So never mind. <laughs> We're going to just type them in the chat. I guess it doesn't work. I don't know why. Because they need to disable the That's when they enable mine. Uh, how do I kind of set what civilization is like and dislike? Um, when it comes to things like shapes and colors or whether it even comes to um, social things, economic things, cultural things, political things, and all these sorts of things, um, in essence, when, when a world is created, there's a list of traits which these different nations can have, and the nations kind of keep picking a trait from that list until the list is empty. And that's basically how all this kind of high level world creation stuff works. Um, and, and then that later filters down into everything else. So for instance, mm -hmm. if a nation picks, like it's a nation which, which likes theater a lot, then you'll, then you'll find lots of books of plays in that nation's bookshops, right? That type of stuff. Um, and yes, uh, the resources of where they are also affects what, what, what they can make. So you do get, um, so the materials used in, in objects and buildings and clothes and so on are dependent on where that nation spawns and what kinds of resources it has access to. It's not completely. And my excuse there is that it's to do with trade. It's because nations are trading with each other. The real answer is if I completely limited what they could make based on resources, and didn't factor in trade, then um, it would. It, then I found in the earlier sim simulations it would really limit the the variety in the world. So the answer to question two is yes, but not completely, um, and that's a a kind of gameplay compromise on that one. All right. Thanks, Mark. Time is Time over, is unfortunately. Over, unfortunately. And we're going to no move problem. to the next Thanks speaker. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, I really appreciate you having me on for the talk. Take care, and I hope the rest of the conference is great. In the meantime.